Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Ramesh Shraub, director of the Qualcomm Institute. It gives me great pleasure to invite everybody here in person. Uh, uh, we are here to ga gathered here to honor Norma Kershaw's philanthropy. Uh, but I have to say that uh, for all the uh, eye candy that you are likely to enjoy later on today in virtual reality, uh, nothing to beat the real reality <laughs> after three years of lockdown almost. So uh, I do want to take a minute uh, to take us back uh, to where we were uh, when we got going back in 2006, uh, on, to be honest, with an eye on the future. Uh, but when we started, uh, we knew that we wanted to make sure we combined technology with its applications and a great deal of the resources that we were able to secure from the state of California when this institute was established back in 2000 was to create advanced facilities. Uh, and, and, and the one that you're in is an example of the space uh, that we set aside uh, to create visual environments in which you could stimulate the imagination in new ways. Uh, but none of these things come alive unless you have uh, researchers, faculty, and scholars from many different disciplines step up and engage and uh, uh, take advantage of this new medium. So we were delighted when Professor Tom Levy reached out and connected with us. Uh, and off we went off on this adventure of cyber archaeology. Uh, and it's been just wonderful to see uh, all the interesting waypoints uh, that we checked in uh, uh, as, uh, as we went through our journey here. Uh, <clears throat> Doug Ramsey just came in to join us. Uh, he was our director of communications back then and was such an instrumental part of uh, so much uh, of, of the reporting that took place about what we did here. Uh, our journey actually uh, uh, started with this partnership, Professor Tom Levy and uh, Tom DeFonte, uh, who had just joined us uh, after spending a whole career at the University of Illinois in Chicago, building these exquisite spaces. And you will see the Star Cave later today. Uh, but we also went out into the field, uh, out in the Middle East, uh, uh, setting up new facilities, uh, going on missions, uh, and gathering data in new ways uh, so that we could display it uh, and make, bring it back uh, to, to the campus community. As we look to the future, I think there is a greater interest yet. Uh, I don't think you can escape uh, reading about the metaverse uh, uh, anymore. Uh, but the journey that we've been on brings together the digital representation of the physical world, rich with sensor data and whatnot as well as a digital representation of the people in the community that want to interact. And it is this combination of the digital representation of the physical world and the digital representation of our personas, bringing them together, that I think is a rich area where we as academics uh, can make a very serious contribution. It is one of the areas in which even industry is betting on big time. Metaverse is not the only company, the future of telecommunications going back to our roots as an institute for telecommunications information technology, that's the big thing they are betting on. You know, 5G, part of it is the so-called internet of space. So as you wander through wherever you might be, you, you see a lot more useful information that pops up because of the use of augmented reality uh, technologies. So there's a lot of industry vectors that are pointing in this direction. There are a lot of social reasons why we want to be uh, uh, engaged as well as uh, uh, what we are doing to the planet. And I think archaeologists and anthropologists have been studying this for generations. They have, we have so much to learn. And we hope uh, through the generosity uh, of uh, our supporters, as well as the academic programs that we have, we'll be able to take advantage of this new technology as we look to the future. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Carol Patton. I'm Dean of Social Sciences. I'm also faculty in the Communication Department. I'm a, a linguist by training. And it gives me great pleasure to be here. Uh, I know we organized this a few months ago and we weren't able to do it. And now here we are back in person. So I'm, I'm hoping this whole experience of being without other people and then being together with people again remind us of what the social science is about. We're all about people, uh, the places that people live, the environment they create, the artifacts they leave behind wherever and anywhere in the world. 
though, uh, I'd like to be sure we take uh, a bit of time because of, of the tremendous impact that Norma has left with um, the social sciences that we honor. Her steadfast support of UC San Diego's work in archaeology. The through her contribution, she supported an endowed chair. She supported um, uh, our marine archaeology, our partnership with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and now this cyber archaeology project. So her impact has been broad, meaningful, and important very deeply important to, to um, how and, and why we do the social sciences. So she's, um, now this, uh, this gratitude is, I speak on behalf of, of my school of social sciences, but I have a personal gratitude to Norma as well. I've been traveling to Israel since 2000 to work on a project um, involving sign language immersion in a Bedouin village just outside of Beersheba. And this is the community of Bedouins who speak Arabic and they use sign language that developed among the deaf and hearing people that live in the village in the last three generations. So I've been able, all my trips to Israel, I've been able personally to stop by and visit some of the, some of the, um, the consequences of, of the generous gift that Norma had made to, to um, UC San Diego. I visited the University of Hyford Marine Archaeology Center. I've, um, I've met with and I've engaged with um, the faculty and the students who are involved in these projects. And I've been able to see how a gift to um, UC San Diego Department of Anthropology became a gift to the Qualcomm Institute, a gift to Script Institution of Oceanography, a gift to um, the University of Haifa, a gift to um, solidifying this partnership. I have a partnership with the University of Haifa as well. So it's just one person, one family to be able to to provide and to, to make a gift possible that has reached it down and affect people far beyond the, the media circle of, of people who know her, her personally. And because of her, we'll reap benefit in what we learn about the long history of Israel and biblical land and what now exists in some of the most interesting and diverse places on earth, culture-wise and language-wise. So our success at the top research university in being able to build uh, an institute like Qualcomm Institution to promote the work of our faculty, to have um, high quality, um, cutting edge graduate programs all come down to the support of people like, like Norma and her commitment to, to the university. So I just want to say one more, um, one more expression of gratitude um, and excitement um, that we'll be able to use the gift um, far into the future. So uh, welcome back to campus. Please enjoy your time together this afternoon. Thank you. On behalf, uh, hi everybody. It's great to, great to see you. Mo most of the people here are my, my good friends. That's why we got a crowd today. On behalf of the Qualcomm Institute Center for Cyber Archaeology and Sustainability, I'd like to welcome you all to this very special day to honor Norma Kershaw's philanthropy to the University of California, San Diego. A special warm welcome to Barbara Rosenthal and Janet Kershaw McClellan, Norma's daughters, so that they can share in how Norma and their late father Rube's gifts continue to strengthen research and teaching about archaeology here at UC San Diego. Many thanks to my Dean of Social Science, Carol Padden, and Qualcomm Institute Director, Ramesh Rao, for their thoughtful words today. We are here to celebrate Norma Kershaw's generosity to UC San Diego in support of archaeology, and in particular, the recent establishment of the new 
Kershaw Endowment for Cyber Archaeology in the Eastern Mediterranean, a $1 million gift that will produce about $40,000 annually to support the Center of Cyber Archaeology and Sustainability here at the Qualcomm Institute, or QI, to conduct research in Israel and the neighboring lands in perpetuity. Norma loved attending cyber archaeology events at the Qualcomm Institute, much like the one you are experiencing today. Norma's visits to the QI began shortly after she and Rube endowed the Norma Kershaw Chair in the Archaeology of Ancient Israel and Neighboring Lands here at UC San Diego in 2006. In those early years, Norma would say, I really like cyber archaeology, but can you tell me in plain words, what does it mean? <laughs> I'm sure some of you are asking that same question, and I'll answer it shortly. I will give you a personal appreciation here of Norma and how her generosity has helped to build excellence in archaeology here at UC San Diego. Norma Kershaw was a remarkable woman. Norma was a visionary who believed in the importance of archaeology for understanding who we are and how we got here. Norma's perspective on philanthropy came both from her particular Jewish American background and from Norma's universalistic embracing of the notion to repair the world, or tikkun olam in Hebrew. For Norma, the aim of creating endowments at leading US universities, Norma also created a chair at the university at UCLA, is to contribute to the greater good of the American society of which, of which she was a part. Another example, Reuben Norma built the Norma Kershaw Auditorium at the Bowers Museum in Orange County. The Bowers director, Peter Keller, is here today. Raise your hand, Peter. Um, yeah, give him a hand. Norma passed away peacefully on September 14, 2020, at the age of 95. Norma trained, was trained as an archaeologist at Columbia University and became a leader in the American Institute of Archaeology, or AIA, establishing two AIA chapters, the Long Island Society, and in 1991, the Orange County Society, where Norma and Rube moved in, to Southern California to be close to family. Norma received many awards and honors. Norma's first archaeological experience was back in 1971 at the famous biblical site of Tel Gezer in Israel. The Hebrew Bible says King Solomon inherited Gezer when he married the Egyptian pharaoh's daughter. It was at Tel Gezer during that very hot summer in 1971 that I first met Norma. I was 17 years old and Norma was 47. I thought she was old at that time. <laughs> That's Norma digging in Israel in the 1970s on the right and me at Tel Gezer serving as a scale at the Middle Bronze Age gate at Gezer. Over the years, Norma and I stayed in touch at ASOR conferences, the Albright Institute in Jerusalem, where I served as assistant director, and many other places. As an older Middle Eastern ar field archaeologist that has spent over 40 years doing field work in the deserts of Israel and Jordan, my remarks will be somewhat modeled on Moses' valedictory address that he delivered across the Jordan River, looking into the promised land just before his death. It is recorded in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. This may be the oldest recorded retirement speech in history. I promise my remarks will not be as long as the book of Deuteronomy. Today, let us think of cyber archaeology as the promised land of archaeology. In, in 2013, thanks to an anonymous donor brought to my attention by Professor Larry Garrity at La Sierra University and Brad Sparks, the QI received a $400,000 gift to host an international conference 
on the Exodus story featured in the Hebrew Bible. With over 40 archaeologists, Egyptologists, biblical scholars, geoscientists, computer scientists, and engineers, this week-long event was the first international conference on the Exodus, and we published the academic papers in a peer-reviewed book with Springer Nature publishers entitled Israel's Exodus in Transdisciplinary Perspective. We've had over 85,000 downloads, so our Exodus volume is actually one of Springer's bestseller academic books. After visiting our cyber archaeology exhibits at the QI for more than seven years, I think the Exodus conference convinced Norma that she wanted to help cyber archaeology at UCSD after her passing. Our Exodus conference also included a completely digital exhibition with 3D and other demos in the spaces you will visit today at the QI. We used sound benders on the big wall in the V room that you'll see so that speakers of Arabic, English, and Hebrew could stand together and experience the Exodus story in their own languages. Here, you can see Dick Atkinson viewing the roots of the Exodus in 3D, and Andrew Viterbi on a tour from our undergraduate, Aliyah Hoff, on the right. What is cyber archaeology? It is the marriage of computer science, engineering, and the natural sciences with archaeology. It takes advantage of the information te technology revolution. Archaeology is, uh, is the science of destruction. When we excavate, we remove sediment, walls, and other features to reach earlier levels, and consequently, we destroy the archaeological record. Cyber archaeology is about developing the most precise methods of recording the context and features of a site so that a permanent 3D digital record is available for scholars and the public to examine. Norma and Rube's philanthropy at UC San Diego began at a Jewish studies program event at the faculty club here. They were in the audience that night. The capstone talk was by Richard Dick Atkinson, who was ending his term as the chancellor of UCSD and taking on being, um, being the president of the University of California. By the way, we are sitting in the Atkinson Hall right now. At the end of the evening, Norma buttonholed Dick Friedman, my colleague and a distinguished biblical scholar, and said, I want to create a chair for Tom. And that is how the Jewish Studies program and the Department of Anthropology have an endowed chair in the archaeology of ancient Israel and neighboring lands. I'll vacate the chair in, on July 1 this year. I tell this tale as a pedagogic moment for my younger colleagues in the audience on how to establish endowed chairs and to remind our administration to please, please fill the Norma Kershaw chair as soon as possible. In 2005, UCSD announced that there was going to be an open house to inaugurate the new building complex for the California Institute of Telecommunication and Information Technology, or CalIT2, now known as the Qualcomm Institute. The building complex we are in today. My wife, Alina Levy, saw the invitation online and insisted that we attend. Norma loved Alina and always reminded me, you better listen to Alina. <laughs> and Norma, I am. <laughs> Every day. The event featured many demos. Uh, when I got to the demo of 3D earthquake data around the Salton Sea in the Star Cave, uh, a large virtual reality environment and precursor to the sun cave you will visit today, um, I, I was struck that uh, our archaeology we were doing in Jordan was perfect for this. It was pre-adapted for this new world. This is because for cyber archaeology, we collect highly accurate X, Y, and Z elevation 
coordinates for every artifact and feature we uh, encounter. The Star Cave and Sun Cave are the brainchild of distinguished computer scientist, the Qualcomm's Tom DeFonte. At the end of the open house, Ramesh uh, announced, quote, any faculty member who would like to get involved with the Qualcomm or with Cal IT2, send me an email. At our first uh, meeting, Ramesh sat me down in his office. I had a PowerPoint ready to go. And Ramesh said, uh, no, you don't need it. Just tell me your dreams. I told him my dreams, and two weeks later, he had arranged a meeting with Tom DeFonte, Jurgen Schultz, and, and there was a total of 10 computer scientists and engineers in that room. I also met the, the founding director and visionary of Cal IT2, Larry Smarr. Under Larry and Ramesh's leadership, the Cal IT2 mission statement says, and you can read it here, inventing a persistent collaborative research and education environment as a model for the major research university in the 21st century. I drank the Kool-Aid in 2005, and until today, this vision inspires me and my students to reach for scholarly excellence and collaboration here and around the world. The Kershaw Endowed Chair has played a central role in helping me fund our work in Jordan's biblical region of Edom, or Edom. Relatively unexplored, this part of Jordan provides new data on biblical Israel uh, from the Iron Age, that is 1200 to 586 BCE, and many other periods. In 1996, thanks to Dr. Ghazi Bisha, Director General of the Department of Antiquities of Jordan, shown here uh, on the right, I was invited to work in Jordan. It was two years after the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan, after four, a 46-year period of a state of war, and people were optimistic. Uh, I'm wearing the red and white keffiyeh there. Um, <laughs> From the beginning, my research partner and dear friend continues to be Dr. Mohammed Najjar, the director of, then the Director of Excavations and Surveys of the Department of Antiquities. Jordan's Fainan region, located south of the Dead Sea, is most famous as one of the world's best preserved ancient copper mining districts. We were given permission to work anywhere we wished in the 250 square kilometer research area. Using cyber archaeology methods that we helped pioneer, we carried out 18 excavation projects and four major surveys. Um, to control and measure time in the archaeological record in Fainan, we applied an unprecedented number of radiocarbon dates, over 120 just for this one ancient copper factory site called Chibet and Nahas that we'll talk about more. We lived in army tents for two months, each expedition season near a Bedouin village, and ran a UC San Diego archaeology field school each season. We rented rooms in the local village for our digital cyber archaeology lab. By 2010, thanks to Cal IT2 Director of Communications, Doug Ramsey, Doug, put your hand up, there he is, and his writing skills, Cal IT2 colleagues Falco Kuster, Maurizio Saracini, and I received a $3.2 million five-year NSF IGERT grant that Doug called TEACH, Training, Research, and Education in Engineering for Cultural Heritage Diagnostics. My responsibility was to bring archaeology into this high-tech mix, and this was achieved through our work in Jordan's Biblical Edom. Many of our graduate students benefited from this NSF grant. Not knowing how long I would be work allowed to work in Jordan, it was crucial to create a digital workflow for data capture, curation, analyses, and dissemination that would guarantee that all the data we excavated abroad could be recorded digitally in the field 
and taken back to UCSD on external drives at the end of each expedition. So already in 1999, our Jordan projects were totally paperless long before it was popular to do so. Cyberarchaeology at UCSD grew in great part to enormous support through the Kershaw Endowed Chair Funds and other matching opportunities. Our most important excavations took place here, the, this place, Chobet al Nahas, which means the ruins of copper in Arabic. At over 25 acres in size and covered in black slag from smelting, from smelting copper ore, it is the largest Iron Age copper production factory in the southern Levant. It dates to the time of King David and Solomon in the 10th century BCE and is at the center of debate concerning the historicity of these Hebrew kings. This model shows what our digital archaeology excavations look like in action at Chibet and Nahas with helium balloon camera systems, a terrestrial LIDAR scanner, 3D artifact scanners, real-time GPS recording, tablets to take notes, and more. Here you can see our students using LIDAR, light detection, and ranging laser range finder scanners uh, at Chirbet Nahas on a cold day in November 19, uh, 2009. This is the uh, monumental gatehouse at Chirbet Nahas. It has a four-chamber gate like many of the early Iron Age fortresses in Israel. If it dates to the 10th century BCE, it can be linked to the activities of a complex society at this time. Egyptian sources and the Hebrew Bible indicate that um, the ancient Edomites and early Israelite kings, David and Solomon, would be in the area at this time. If the gatehouse dates to the 10th century BCE, it supports the idea that kingdoms like ancient Edom and Israel existed as mentioned in the sacred and other texts. Let's see how cyber archaeology can be applied to this problem where we take the, the uh, terrestrial LIDAR data and we're going to fly through it now. Now here, that's the fortress and now we're flying to the gatehouse and what you're looking at are the layers of the excavation that we recorded with geographic information system and now we've cut through it to look at these data sets and we've plotted the actual location of the radiocarbon dates that are going to help us date when this ancient fortress was made. Now we're inside one of the fortress gatehouse rooms and you can see those 1019 to 926 BC dates. Those all put this gatehouse in the 10th century BCE. So it adds veracity to the biblical narrative. The Center for Cyber Archaeology likes to partner. In 2012, we were asked by the American Center of Overseas Research in Oman to do 3D imaging of the center of Petra, the famous Nabataean UNESCO World Heritage Site not far from Fainan, where we work. I call these kind of project, projects bo boutique projects. Uh, Matt Howland, now Dr. Matt, ran around Petra, for, I made him do it, uh, ran around Petra for hours with our helium balloon photography system collecting photogrammetry data. Matt will demo these today. And here um, we can see where we've taken these images together, processed them into 3D models, like the one you see here of the Al Khazna, or the treasury at Petra. It's a mortuary monument from the first century AD. Petra was the capital of the Nabataean Arabs who had a trading kingdom in the Middle East. The treasury was featured in the Indiana Jones movie, The Last Crusade. How many saw, have seen that movie? Excellent, everybody. <laughs> when King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, or KAUST, 
was building its campus in, in 2009, Tom DeFonte secured a large grant for the QI to build them a scientific visualization laboratory. Thus began a close, close collaboration with the Saudis and Tom invited me to showcase our Jordan data at the Kaus Grand Opening. One of our recent graduate students then, Neil Smith, became a research scientist in the, in the Kaus lab after he graduated. Neil invited me to join him in a boutique project in Saudi Arabia to 3D image the biblical site of Didan in the Al Ula Oasis. Then we went to nearby Maden Salah, the southernmost and second largest Nabataean mortuary center after Petra, with, and this is 500 uh, kilometers southeast. Using a drone, we recorded a cluster of Nabataean tombs at the site. We also scanned them with terrestrial LIDAR to compare the methods. And, we published this, and so here, this is the drone view of those tombs. And you can see some of our, I think that's Neil standing over there on the precipice. Here you can see the 3D model Neil produced that can be used for research and promotion of tourism. By 2015, the Islamic State had conquered vast areas of Syria and Iraq. As part of their consolidation of power, they intentionally destroyed UNESCO World Heritage Sites, like Palmyra in Syria, and many other sites. This destruction led UC San Diego's Center for Cyber Archaeology to apply for a very competitive University of California Office of the President Catalyst Grant. In December of 2015, UC President Janet Napolitano announced that we received a three-year, uh, or sorry, it was a two-year grant of one million, over a million dollars, to help bring four UC campuses together, UCSD, UCLA, UC Merced, and Berkeley, for a project entitled At-Risk World Heritage and the Digital Humanities. The funding helped our fa UC faculty Gra uh, graduate students and undergrads from the four campuses to travel to Israel, Greece, Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, and Ethiopia. And they were collecting digital data to process back home. And then we could disseminate the work in peer-reviewed uh, publications and other venues. We partnered with Glenn Yego and the Milken Innovation Centers in Santa Monica and Jerusalem to build collaborative business models for cultural heritage and other in um, Israel and other countries. Sometime in late 2015, the Islamic State destroyed St. Elijah's Greek Orthodox Monastery in Iraq. It was built in five, 590 AD. This is the third oldest monastery in the Middle East. And here you can see it, they flattened it. Um, and, and this we, uh, archeologists picked up on remote sensing data. This was a wake up call for our, 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 our catalyst team to travel to the Judean desert in Israel and the Palestinian territories to carry out a 3D um, virtual uh, reality project at Mar Saba, built in 483 AD, and the second oldest monastery in the Middle East. At the time, it was difficult to bring a drone into Israel, so we used our helium balloon system, and you can see the balloon flying over the monastery there. And now, this 3D model that we built is contributing to the uh, Milken Institute's cultural heritage asset district model for the Kidron Valley that begins near the old city of Jerusalem and flows to the Dead Sea. And this involves trying to bring Israeli and Palestinian communities together. We're still working on it. Um, you can experience personal VR today uh, downstairs with Neil uh, after lunch. 
After 40 years of doing terrestrial archaeology in the deserts of the Holy Land, it was getting hot. <laughs> in 2016, Professor John Hildebrand, a geophysicist from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and me from Anthropology, were asked to co-direct the new Scripps Center of Marine Archaeology. Is, is John in the audience? There he is over there. Well, great news, he was just elected vice chair of U, the UCSD Academic Senate. <laughs> Mazel tov, as we say. Although I first became a scuba diver in 1969, I was 15, at the age of 62, I took the Scripps 100-hour science diving course under Christian McDonald, and soon Scripps uh, science diving program became a, an integral part of the SCMA mission. I suggested that we bring our terrestrial-based cyber archaeology workflow underwater and use the many research connections in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean to help jumpstart SCMA. We developed a three-prong approach to marine archaeology at UCSD, shallow marine geophysical surveying, paleo-environmental research and sediment coring, and underwater excavation and photogrammetry. My grad student, Tony Tamburino, has played a big role in this. We made it happen by partnering with Scripps and colleagues in the Eastern Mediterranean. Norma's endowment will help us continue to build on this. Over the past five years, we promoted graduate student research, created field schools for undergraduates in Greece and Israel, built a joint University of Haifa, UCSD, Marine Archaeology Research Station in Akko, in Israel, had the SIO science diving team with us in the field, and encouraged philanthropists like Norma to support us. We achieved this by partnering with the University of Patras in Greece, with professors George Papadiotoro and Maria Garaga, who are leaders in shallow marine geophysics, and the university in Haifa, led by Professor Asaf Yasur Landau. The University of Haifa are pioneers in underwater archaeological excavation. International, national, and our local Scripps researchers, including Dick Norris, Lisa Tokes, John Hildebrand, and others, have contributed excellence in geoscience to these projects. You just saw our graduate student, Lauren Clark, on the left hammering a core in 20 feet of water near the submerged uh, Middle Bronze Age site of Methoni, which dates to around 2000 to 1500 BCE. Those cores will be part of uh, Lauren's PhD, and she'll demo um, some of this uh, underwater uh, uh, photogrammetry and so on outside after lunch. In 2020, we received a three-year, $1.3 million award that ends this December from the Corep Foundation in San Francisco as part of our U.S.-Israel bridge building initiative. Coret generously is making it possible for us to carry out the scientific exploration of Israel's coastal environments that offer some of the most sensitive deep time records of how humans have adapted to climate and environmental change over the past 100,000 years. Our partner is the University of Haifa's new School of Archaeology. Check out our postdoc, Dr. Gilad Steinberg's demo in the V Room, and the posters re related to this and our other projects presented by our science project manager, Dr. Margie Burton, after lunch. During the height of the COVID pandemic in November 2020, with over 50 team members from UCSD and the University of Haifa, we carried out an underwater excavation in Israel using high-tech remote uh, uh, collaboration. Our UCSD, UCSD team could not travel to Israel due to COVID. However, 
Our University of Haifa colleagues conducted the excavation and each day after work uploaded their digital data so that we could process it here uh, in California um, in the morning. We sort of worked 24 seven. They would send us 3D uh, files of artifacts like a Neolithic flint ax and we could 3D print it here and do the research on the artifact almost in real time. And um, Jack Reese is gonna show you some of that uh, in the V room. The results were fantastic and we won a collaborative scenic award for remote digital innovation. And here's a little uh, one minute video clip showing all the activity that was going on in the V room next door when we were doing this uh, remote collaboration. We'll develop this into a nice uh, film um, in, in the next few months. There's the underwater excavation. And although we couldn't be in the field, we were virtually a very um, significant part of the whole uh, process of, of from data capture to analysis to, to its, uh, its dissemination. Um, okay, um, fast forward to a few weeks ago to May 2nd when SCMA had its first five-year review by three highly respected non-UCSD underwater archeologists and two noted faculty marine scientists from Scripps, students, faculty, staff, S the SCMA advisory board members, some of them were interviewed. John Hildebrand and our team put a lot of preparation into the review and f everybody felt good about it. John and I were surprised when eight days later we received a short email from the Scripps administration saying we were dismissed as SCMA co-directors as of July 1. The reviewer's report had not been submitted when this decision was made. I bring this up because I want to assure the Coret Foundation, who would be looking at, at, at this, that by continuing this project through the Qualcomm Institute Center for Cyber Archaeology, we will meet all our obligations. Tikkun, tikkun olam, repairing the world, as Norma would remind us, is the way to go. The Center for Cyber Archaeology aims to continue to build bridges through what I have called archaeodiplomacy. With the new Kershaw Endowment, our center will use cyber archaeology to build toward what a friend of mine calls the Alexander Accords. In our case, strengthening the research and educational ties between Greece, Cyprus, and Israel with American partnership using cyber archaeology. We hope to bring Turkey into this effort. I may not make it into the promised land of the new cyber archaeology. However, UCSD graduates, many of them you're going to see today, will lead the way. I mentioned Dr. Neil Smith. Neil recently returned from seven years as a research uh, scientist at KAUST. Neil will serve as the new co-director of the Center for Cyber Archaeology and Sustainability. Neil, where are you? Can you stand? There he is. <laughs> Neil, Neil was uh, one of my students and has a UCSD PhD in anthropological archaeology with a focus on biblical archaeology and computer science. And he speaks fluent Arabic. So he's well adapted to help build the Abraham Accords in cyber archaeology across the Middle East and help with all our projects. A final note, looking out from across the Jordan into the promised land of cyber archaeology, one of my academic heroes is Yale law professor Amy Chua, who wrote the book Political Tribes, Group Instinct, and the fate of nations. Chua writes that among the major powers today, America is unique in being a supergroup. America is distinct where membership is open to individuals 
from all different backgrounds, ethnic, religious, racial, gender, and cultural. America does not require its members to shed or suppress their subgroup identities. On the contrary, it allows those subgroup identities to thrive, even as individuals are bound together by a strong, overarching collective identity. It is in this spirit that archaeology at UC San Diego intersects with all the major scholarly schools at a research university today, and how this American research university can come together to reach out to all the communities where we work, whether in the Eastern Mediterranean, around the world, or here in California. Thank you very much. I'm not going to read all the names here. We would be here much too long, but I'm so thankful to all the presenters and organizers listed here. And now I'd like to call um, Michael Horvat, director of, uh, uh, executive director of development, to come up here. Michael, please. And we're going to also ask Barbara and Janet to please come on up. Yeah, this way. Thank you, Professor Levy. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. It's so great to see so many familiar faces, so many new faces, and to be together, as Director Rao said, in person to share a common humanity. Uh, Norma Kershaw's uh, philanthropy and her impact is not just local at UC San Diego. We heard that. It's not just at UCLA. It's not just throughout California. It's globally. And we are so thankful. And I have the great pleasure of presenting just a small token of our appreciation. We're going old school. Because you know, there's no doubt in my mind that Tom and the entire uh, Center for Cyber Archaeology and Sustainability will be at the forefront of 3D digital uh, transformation, that you'll be part of the metaverse, that we'll have our own public corner of the metaverse. But sometimes there's nothing like having a book just to curl up at home and read. <laughs> and you know, and just read and, and, and have that tactile um, connection with it. So this is a very special book. It's Preserving Cultural Heritage in the Digital Age with Tom Levy and a series of collaborators. And we want to give you each a personally inscribed copy. And I hope that this is just a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so on behalf of the UC San Diego Qualcomm Institute, the Division of Social Sciences, the UC Center for Cyber Archaeology and Sustainability, we wanted to thank all of you. We'd love for uh, Dean Patton and Director Rao to just join us on stage real briefly for a photo opportunity. And again, to say thank you so much to Barbara and Janet, the entire Kershaw family, and for all of you coming today to join us and celebrate. Thank you. Oh, and um, one other thing. Everybody gets a free t-shirt today, okay? So on the way out, um, I mean, when you leave from the festivities today, please pick up your t-shirt and leave your email because your email address, we want to build community. So on this side, the center, on the other side, to mark the establishment of the endowment. So everybody gets one. That was my role, so I so want you to be brand ambassadors. I'm sorry, I do. we want you to be brand ambassadors, I think the current vernacular is with us. So please um, take a t-shirt on the way and join us. Okay, so please join us for lunch. The buffet's out there, Mediterranean style. And then you're welcome to visit all the cool spaces that are gonna be open. Thank you very much.